Good morning, everybody. Good morning to hearing number nine of the 180 period of sessions. The name of the hearing is situation of human rights of persons in the context of human mobility in migration detention centers in the United States. The hearing was requested by a group of civil society organizations. I won't mention them uh, because of time restrictions. My name is Antonia Urejola. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission. And today with me are uh, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, that are, she's also the rapporteur for migrants. We also have the second vice president and commissioner, Flavia Piovesan, Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, the rapporteur for economic, social, cultural, environmental rights, and Maria Claudia Pulido, that is secretary of monitoring. Also the team of the executive secretariat are, are here. We have the interpreters and we also have the team and the technical team of this different rapporteurships that are related to today's hearing. As you can see below, there is a glove icon uh, for those who require interpretation. Put the interpretation down on, the, on the globe that you have on your, on your screens. Um, de acuerdo como corresponde en esta audiencia, en primer lugar. Um, first, uh, in this hearing, the representation of civil society will have 20 minutes. Please introduce yourselves when you take the floor. And then the state will have 20 minutes to present. And after that, the commission will have another 20 minutes for questions and comments. And after that, civil society will have 12 more minutes and the state will have 12 more minutes. And then the commission will close the hearing. I would like to request you to uh, comply with time, uh, with the time schedule. Uh, you will see a clock on the screen uh, that will be recording time. I would like to let you know when there are only five minutes left. Sometimes it's very difficult because we are having a heated discussion, but please uh, bear in mind um, those times restrictions. And if there is any issues with the timer, the team of the executive secretariat will let you know. Uh, on the screen, you will see that we have closed caption for people with hearing uh, impairments. And also this hearing is being broadcasted uh, or uh, in Twitter and on Facebook. Having said that, now I would like to give the floor to the organizations of civil society for 20 minutes and please, Introduce yourselves as you take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Good morning, and thank you for granting us this hearing. More than a decade ago, I first appeared before this honorable commission, as I do today, alongside, oh, sorry, my name is Sarah Paoletti uh, with the Transnational Legal Clinic at the University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School. Um, I appeared before this honorable commission, as I do today, alongside rights organizations, advocates, and immigrants themselves to address human rights violations committed within the system of immigrant detention. A series of thematic hearings and a site visit to detention centers in the United States culminated in the Commission's 2011 report, Immigration in the U.S. Detention and Due Process. In the years that followed, the U.S. introduced new detention standards, but rights violations persisted as the United States' oversight and enforcement of those standards and the standards of them themselves have consistently fallen short of the United States' obligations to respect, protect, and ensure the rights of all those in its jurisdiction. Now a decade since the commission's 2011 report, we are again before the commission because the United States persists in detaining immigrants as a means of immigration enforcement and deterrence. And immigrants and their families continue to suffer egregious rights violations as a direct and foreseeable result. The international community took note when a whistleblower nurse and women who had been detained at the Irwin County Detention Center joined with advocates here today and filed and publicized a complaint with the Department of Homeland Security that included reports of non-consensual gynecological procedures, some of which resulted in sterilization. You will hear directly from one of those women today, Wendy Dow, 
uh, who's appearing under the name of Priyanka Bhatt uh, for the purposes of this hearing. Uh, Azadeh Shashahani, the legal and policy director of Pod Project South, will discuss the United States' persistent failure to respect and ensure the rights of immigrants it holds in private corporations in Georgia, a failure that has con directly contributed to the rights abuses at Irwin. Satare Gandahari, advocacy director for Detention Watch Network, will conclude our presentation by placing the United States' grievous failure to respect and protect the rights of individuals held at Stewart and Irwin facilities in Georgia in context, highlighting the rights abuses that are endemic to the United States' system of immigrant detention. The rights abuses, which are also detailed in our written submission, together with our proposed recommendations, include the following violations of the American Declaration and other rights obligations. The right to dignity and security in person, the right to health, the right to freedom from forced labor, the right to protection of family life, due process rights, the right to seek asylum, the right to freedom of expression, the right to non-discrimination, and the right to freedom from retaliation for exercising the aforementioned rights for all persons subject to its custody, as well as the right to freedom of expression for human rights defenders in Georgia and across the United States seeking to assert those rights. We seek recognition of and accountability for the grave and persistent rights abuses committed against immigrants held in detention centers in Georgia and across the United States, and the failure of the United States to take the necessary measures to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of those held in custody. We seek redress and reparations for those whose rights have been violated, and finally, we urge the Commission to call upon the United States to bring an end to immigrant detention. As the Center for Victims of Torture has just compellingly set forth in a report issued last week, the system of immigrant detention is inherently violative of the United States' obligations under CAT and other international human rights treaties and norms. It is not enough to talk of standards, as standards have done little to protect those taken into ICE custody and locked away in, in detention centers across the United States, as you'll hear this morning. Azadeh. Thank you very much. Good morning, honorable commissioners. My name is Azadeh Shahani. I serve as legal and advocacy director at Project South and also co-counsel on the class action lawsuit that was filed on behalf of survivors of medical abuse at the Irving County Detention Center in Georgia, which was the site of systematic medical abuse against immigrant women, including forced sterilizations. We have in fact documented conditions at Irving for many years, and we know that the treatment of immigrants at this prison has always been horrid. In our 2017 report, In Prison Justice Inside Two Georgia Immigrant Detention Centers, Project South and the Penn State uh, Law Center for Immigrants Rights Clinic found evidence of sexual abuse, inadequate medical care, lack of prenatal care for pregnant women, lack of clean drinking water, and rampant use of solitary confinement at this prison. Those who have spoken about the abuses over the years have consistently faced retaliation. In September 2020, our complaint filed um, alongside other groups on the ground with the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General um, also highlighted issues related lack of protection for COVID. So for example, medical staff deliberately not testing detained immigrants for COVID-19 even when they were symptomatic had pre-existing conditions and or had requested to be tested multiple times spanning a month and management mandating employees to work even when they were symptomatic and waiting for test results. The shocking revelations about medical abuse against women's bodies further highlight the extent of the egregious abuses at the prison and the fact that black and brown immigrant women have been held in an extremely vulnerable position at this prison where they had no control over their bodies and no say about what was done to them is sickening. We are glad that our complaint opened the door to more women coming forward with accounts of what was done to them. In total, more than 40 women filed sworn testimony in court as part of the lawsuit, despite consistent attempts by ICE to silence them. It pains me to know that there could be many more women out there who will never be able to talk about what happened to them and the abuse that they suffered while at Irving, let alone receive a measure of redress while living with the lifelong damage to their bodies and spirits. Not surprisingly, ICE has not been forthcoming with information. Rather, they've been actively trying to cover their own tracks through deporting survivors and witnesses to medical abuse. If it was not because of the documentation work happening and advocates' efforts to track down and reach out to women all over the world and courage of the impacted women, none of this would have ever come to light. 
ICE already deported six survivors and was trying to deport several more before lawyers and members of Congress have stepped, have stepped in. And they also used tactics of retaliation against those who spoke out, such as threats of placing women in solitary or actually subjecting them to solitary confinement. The court filing also includes evidence showing that ICE and private contractors at the prison knew as far back as 2018 about the medical abuse being inflicted on women, and yet they did nothing. Instead, they kept sending women to the same doctor. Pursuant to the class action lawsuit, all known survivors of medical abuse have now been released. However, women are now transferred to the Stuart Detention Center, a deadly corporate-run prison with a forced labor program and a documented record of other egregious human rights violations. This is an extremely troubling development and a clear attempt by ICE to deflect attention from abuses at Irving. There have been eight deaths at Stuart since May 2017, two by suicide, four during the pandemic. And in fact, the Stuart has been the deadliest ICE prison during the pandemic. There have been more than 700 cases of COVID-19 infections at Stuart, yet ICE continues to detain the elderly and people with pre-existing conditions at Stuart during the pandemic, which tells you how much they don't care about the well-being of people in their custody. In addition, internal documents show that ICE surveilled human rights advocates' protest activities, including ours in Georgia, and considered retaliating against them for it. Instead of addressing the grave issues that advocates are raising, ICE is using intimidation in an attempt to silence us. In closing, in terms of what we need for accountability, the scrutiny must not stop with examining the actions of one individual. This is about ICE and the private prison corporation law Saul. Both Irving and Stewart must be shut down immediately and people should be freed. And the egregious retaliation against those who spoke out must end. The women who suffered medical abuse should receive redress for the harm that they suffered and the US government as well as the private prison corporations running these prisons must be held accountable. And I would like to leave you with this quote from freedom fighter Fannie Lou Hamer. Nobody's free until everybody's free. Thank you very much. I would like to turn it over to survivor Wendy Dow who was detained at Irvine and is courageously joining us to speak out now. Hi, hello, good morning, each and everyone. My name is Wendy Olivia Dow. I'm one of the survivors of um, Irving County abuse. And um, I'm the survivor of retaliation from ICE because I spoke out. I went to Irving County um, back in September 2018, the 28th of September 2018. From the day I enter Irving County, it's like I was in hell. The place, how the place look, and the treatment from the get go when you get there. In January of 2019, I think um, I was suffering from abdominal pain. I suffered with hypertension. And at the time, because of the stress I was going through, my hypertension went worse. So I was suffering from abdominal pain. So I text medical written and send it to them, send a request to them. They refer me to Dr. Amin. When I went to Dr. Amin, he told me that I got multiple cysts in me. And um, the first day I went, he gave me a depot shot. I think on my second visit, he told me that um, I got a tumor as big as a cantaloupe. After then, I was woken up like 5 a.m. one morning. I asked where I was going. They can't stay protocol. They can't tell me where I'm going because of their safety. When I went there, I went to Erring County Hospital. Because of my hypertension, my vision was going and um, I wasn't in the right frame of mind then. After I woke up, I know that they gave me injection. After I woke up, I was woken up in Irving County Medical Room. At the, at the time, I was like woozy and start feeling pain down in my lower abdomen. When I try to feel what's going on, I felt like three bandages on my stomach. Starting to ask the nurse what happened. They told me that they can't answer me until they get the, the, the medical form from Dr. Amin. 
Later after that, I was still sick, couldn't get up, couldn't walk. No medicine, no pain meds, no antibiotics, nothing, no gauze, no treatment from nurses or anything at all. I repeatedly asked them for pain medicine because I was just gutted into and no type of pain medicine. After the fact, I knew that, noticed I was getting eye fever. After I looked, went into the bathroom and looked, my stomach was like yellow. I was suffering from a lot of infection from the wounds. I start writing to them again, tell them that I have an infection. That's when they came and they gave me antibiotics. They gave me one dose of pain medicine, told me that my refill was expired. After the fact that I was sick and everything, I noticed that they take me back to Dr. Admin. I'm not specific when or what time, but they took me back and they told me that, he told me that I have to have a hysterectomy. That's when I tell him that I'm not gonna have no more surgery based on what I went through last time. I signed a refusal form then not to have a hysterectomy. They took me back to Irving County where I start questioning everything. So I start speaking to guards and everything when they told me that, some of the guards told me that I don't need to do no surgery because Dr. Admin is fake and they've started telling me about stuff that happening to other females. I start looking into it, that's when I call Project South and I call Family for Freedom, trying to get my voice out, trying to let people know what's going on. Based upon the phone, I couldn't get through a lot. That's when I spoke to one reporter. After start speaking to a reporter, ICE agent found and telling me that, you know, I was talking to ICE agent, I was talking too much, and I was calling the 9116 number. I was calling his inspector general's number and everything. So me and one of the ICE agents, we got into it. After that, I was in solitary confinement. Then they brought me to, I was in solitary confinement because of my hypertension. I couldn't breathe. I was hyperventilating. So they took me that night to a trailer, to the trailer where they called G. After being there, I didn't, I couldn't get a lot of phone calls. I couldn't get to reach out to anybody. So I couldn't get in tablets or anything. So shortly after that, they still brought me to Dr. Admin like two, three times to have a hysterectomy. When I went to nurse school, nurse school called me and said, I'm refusing medical help. I'm telling her, I'm not refusing any type of medical help, but I'm not gonna have another surgery in this situation that I'm here in the place is dirty. It's not capable to, 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 for no humans to be there. It's nasty. And based upon what I went through, I'm not gonna do it again. They keep forcing it on me until they said I got psychiatric problem. They try to refer me to psychiatric evaluation, try to refer me to the psych ward. I'm telling them I'm not going there because nothing is wrong with me. After they try to tell me that based upon the tumor that I have in me, that's what's sucking my blood. That's why my vision is going. That's why I'm dizzy. I'm I, I sucking to what they were telling me. So I went to the psych. They start giving me pill that react to my body very badly. I start telling them I'm not taking no more pill and I'm not going to no more psych ward. They, I now start telling me that I need to sign a form that I'm refusing medical help. So if anything happened to me, it's not on them. After being there, being there, being there suffering, one day I fell into the shower because of lack of vision in, in, in G. That's when I hit the back of my head, hit my back. When I get up, I was in medical. The medical um, nurse trying to tell me that she's trying to send me out to the hospital, but she can't send me without somebody to give her the go ahead to send me out. That night they couldn't get a higher person to send me out. So I stayed all night at Irving County suffering from that pain. In the day, the morning came, they wheelchair me to the medical when they tell me that I'm fine. Up until this day, I'm suffering from that heartache that I went through in that bathroom. I'm suffering from medical, medical. I'm suffering from physical, mental abuse, and I'm still going through it. And all I'm asking and why I'm speaking out for this to stop, 
for it, a next person, a next woman, a next mother, a next child, don't have to go through the humiliation, the suffering that me and my children went through. I have a 12 year old disabled child that is here now with me in Jamaica. Can't get any medical help, can't get anything. I can't take her to the doctor because she's an American citizen. It's money down here and everything. It's like I'm in a country that I'm not used to because I've been in the US over a decade. And I got a 15 year old that was abused while my incarceration. She was only 15 at the time. So I'm asking, please, I'm pleading for it to stop for nobody else to go through this type of abuse. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Satara Gandahari. I'm the advocacy director at Detention Watch Network. Uh, what you heard should shock the conscience. Unfortunately, these experiences are not unique to the state of Georgia. They're emblematic of the entire US immigration detention system, which is a part of the US system of mass incarceration that has a disproportionate impact on people of color and on, in particular on black people. Over the last 24 years, Detention Watch Network has monitored and documented abuses throughout immigration and customs enforcement, ICE detention, which has expanded over that time to include over 200 detention centers and jails across the country, detaining 55,000 people at its height in 2019. Currently, there are over 26,000 people in ICE detention, a number that has been rapidly increasing over the last few months. Every year, up to 500,000 people are detained in ICE custody. As you will see in our written submission, there's a, an extensive history of abuse and neglect in the US detention system, documented over decades by civil society, govern, government inspectors, and journalists. Despite small wins in oversight and attempts at transparency, the system has only grown more abusive and deadly as it rips communities and families apart. This past year, as the world grappled with COVID-19, the inhumanity of immigration detention has only been heightened. Immigration detention is punitive in nature and fundamentally at odds with the concepts of human rights, dignity, and freedom. The detention system is rife with a lack of access to adequate health care and even medical abuse, as you have just heard. This past fiscal year, 21 people lost their lives in ICE custody, the deadliest year since 2005. Staff often exhibit a callous disregard for the health of the, people, of the people in their custody, ignoring requests for medical attention or offering inadequate or inappropriate care. During the pandemic, there have been reports of people being told to stay quiet about their COVID symptoms, sent back to their quarters with little more than Tylenol or put in punitive isolation, not medically appropriate quarantine. There's been a lack of testing and spotty and insufficient access to vaccination. ICE fails to provide adequate access to the most basic necessities like toilet paper, shampoo, soap, toothpaste, let alone face masks. The food they serve is often rotten or, or expired, including, for example, slimy chicken, moldy bread, foul smelling lunch meat. At many facilities, people are completely isolated from community and legal support and have no access or little to outdoor recreation. Instances of verbal, physical, and sexual abuse are well documented. Often abuse such as pepper spray or isolation are in fact retaliation for people speaking up for themselves and asking for their basic needs to be met. Over 70% of detention facilities operate through intergovernmental agreements between the federal government and state and local governments. Often these are then passed through to private prison companies. Over 80% of people held in ICE custody are in facilities operated by private prison corporations. This means that almost the entire system is motivated by profit. Companies and governments get paid for each human they detain, literally profiting from human suffering. Often companies and local governments get paid for a minimum number of beds, regardless of the number of people they actually detain. These types of con contractually guaranteed minimums motivate ICE to fill beds to avoid the appearance of wasting government money. 
However, I must underscore that removing the profit motive alone is not sufficient and that facilities owned by the federal government have the same track record of abuse. Like the brave women who spoke up about the abuse they faced at Irwin, people in detention across the country have been speaking up for themselves, telling us about the abuses they face and demanding freedom from sit down strikes and work stoppage, stoppages to thousands of detained people participating in organized hunger strikes last year during the pandemic. People risk their lives and face the very real threat of retaliation, including physical force, rubber bullets, solitary confinement, force feeding and deportation. We must honor the people and follow their lead. State governments across the United States have been taking action to ban private prisons and keep ICE detention out of their state. From Maryland to Washington to California and others, it's time for the federal government to act. Today, we urge the commission to call on the United States to take the actions necessary to respect, protect and ensure the rights of all those under its jurisdiction. This means immediately ending all contracts with private prison corporations and all intergovernmental agreements between the federal government and state and local governments for the purpose of immigration processing and detention as a first step towards completely dismantling the use of immigration detention. And as long as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, the right to health means that people must be released from detention for the sake of those detained, as well as for the public health. I refer you to our written submission for a more detailed list of recommendations and for the uh, extensive documentation that we've offered that explains more about the abuses that have gone on in the system over the years. And again, I thank you for your time and look forward to a dialogue with you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't want to interrupt, but you, you took four more minutes. So I will rest, um, re um, rest them afterwards, because afterwards we have 12 minutes, so you will have eight minutes at the end, okay? Um, thank you very much, and especially thank you, Wendy, for your testimony. Um, I will give now the floor to the representatives of the state. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, buenos dias. Um, it's very much an honor to be here. Good morning, honorable commissioners, petitioners, the secretariat staff and colleagues, and especially to Ms. Dell on behalf of the United States Department of Homeland Security or DHS. I welcome the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and to engage with the IACHR and petitioners on these important matters relating to the promotion and protection of human rights. My name is Kathy Culleton Gonzalez, and I was appointed on January 20th by President Biden to serve as the US Department of Homeland Security's Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, or CRCL. I'm designated by DHS to protect civil rights and civil liberties and to ensure that the department meets our international human rights treaty obligations. Today, I wanna to provide you with more information about recent, about, with information about recent efforts the department has taken as well as to express our commitments to continue the immigration reform and racial justice work begun at the advent of the new administration. Equally as important, I'm here today to receive your feedback and concerns and can to consider ways to address the issues we've heard about today. To update you, since January 20th, pursuant to several immigration related and, and equity based executive orders issued by President Biden, we have been working to improve our immigration system to make it more orderly and humane. These improvements include seeking to provide greater opportunities for non-citizens to apply for any form of relief or protection for which they may be eligible, including asylum, withholding of removal, and protection from removal under the regulations implementing the U.S. obligations under the Convention Against Torture. We have begun processing into the United States individuals who had been returned to Mexico by the last administration. The department is also conducting a comprehensive examination of current rules, regulations, decisions, and internal guidelines governing the adjudication of humanitarian pr protection claims and determination of refugee status to help ensure that the United States provides protection for individuals fleeing persecution or torture in a manner consistent with our domestic laws and international obligations. These measures may alleviate some of the pressures on detention. Second, on January 20th, the then acting Secretary of Homeland Security issued a memorandum on the review of an interim revision to civil enforcement and removal policies and priorities, 
and called upon DHS to coordinate a department-wide review of all policies and practices concerning immigration enforcement. These include policies governing detention. As a result, DHS is reviewing its detention policies, including procedures around arrests and policies that govern the care and protection of vulnerable populations. The department is also launching a new alternatives to detention pilot program that will provide community-based case management services in select geographic locations to individuals. The pilot program will include mental health services, <clears throat> human and sex trafficking screening, legal orientation programs, cultural orientation programs, connections to social services, and for individuals who will be returned to their home countries, departure planning and reintegration services. The pilot program is being led by CRCL, my office, in collaboration with ICE and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Further, DHS is also committed to strengthening its oversight of the conditions in detention confinement facilities and to close ICE detention facilities that do not meet the health and safety requirements in ICE's detention standards. On May 20th, Secretary Mayorkas directed ICE to prepare to discontinue the use of Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia, a facility about which you raised particular concerns today, he, uh, as well as the C. Carlos Carrero Immigration Des Detention Center, also referred as Bristol in Massachusetts. The secretary signaled that the department will not tolerate the mistreatment of individuals in civil immigration detention or substandard conditions of detention. Secretary Mayorkas further indicated that he will continue to review concerns with other federal immigration detention centers and has instructed DHS leadership to provide updates on ICE's current and potential operational needs, the quality of treatment of detained individuals, the conditions of detention, and other factors relevant to the continued operation of each facility. We are working among several oversight offices. For our part at CRCL, oversight of DHS immigration detention facilities is a key part of our mission. CRCL reviews and investigates complaints from the public and or reports by other sources alleging violations of civil rights or civil liberties by DHS personnel, programs, or activities. Complaints may include allegations about inadequate conditions of detention and alleged violations of non-citizens' rights while in detention. For example, CRCL works within the department and ICE to strengthen safeguards against sexual abuse and assaults of people in DHS custody, including by conducting investigation into ICE's handling of sexual abuse allegations. Once CRCL opens a complaint, we refer the complaint to the department's Office of Inspector, Office of Inspector General, <clears throat> excuse me, which has the right of first refusal to investigate the allegations that were submitted to us. If the inspector general retains the complaint for investigation, CRCL generally must wait until the inspector general has completed its investigation before we can determine whether to conduct our own investigation, if necessary. If the inspector de general decides to investigate the complaint, it is returned to CRCL for our investigation. CRCL opened 4,884 complaint investigations from 2014 to 2020. Of these, 2,607 alleged inadequate medical or mental health care in detention facilities, 447 alleged inappropriate conditions of detention, 267 alleged excessive force, and 136 alleged abuse of authority by DHS employees or contractors. In fiscal year 2020, CRCL conducted eight on-site investigations at facilities where individuals were in ICE custody. In FY21, we have already conducted five investigations. We are planning to conduct six more. After investigating, CRCL provides senior leadership of the components with our investigative conclusions of all complaints and any applicable recommendations. CRCL also notifies the complainant of the results of the investigation, except in instances where we are unable to, con to contact them. CRCL's complaint recommendations have prompted DHS components to implement improvements to policies and, pr and practices and to create and update training materials. CRCL has issued numerous expert recommendation memoranda running, uh, resulting from on-site investigations into conditions of detention for individuals in ICE as well as CBP Border Patrol custody. CRCL recommendations have led to improvements in detention facility conditions in the areas of medical and mental health care and improvements in training and oversight. Our expert recommendations have also informed CRCL's ongoing work with components such as ICE 
on issues extending beyond investigations, including CRCL's review of ISIS hoteling practices and COVID-19 readiness. 53% of CRCL's complaint investigations involve allegations of inadequate medical care in ICE facilities. In these cases, CRCL and ICE removal operations maintain a process for referring and addressing complaints received by CRCL concerning the medical, dental, and, med and medical health, mental health care provided to individuals in ICE custody. Through its work with ICE removal operations, CRCL strives to one, bring emergent medical concerns to ICE's deten attention when detained individuals may be at imminent risk of harm. Two, inquire about and receive sufficient information from ICE to resolve and close alleged concerns that are unfounded and that have been adequately addressed. And three, determine whether there are any remaining additional or systemic medical con concerns that call for further inquiry or investigation by CRCL. The success of these medical referrals relies heavily on ICE providing a timely response. CRCL has interfaced with the ICE Health Services Corporation regarding life-altering altering conditions such as HIV, cancer, and other serious medical and mental health concerns, and we intend to continue to do so. We do so with the aim of assisting ICE Health Corporation to immediately address the issues for individuals in ICE custody and to improve the overall quality of medical, dental, and mental health care pursuant to detention standards that facilities are required to follow. Let me talk about Irwin. CRCL has specifically addressed complaints related to medical care to, at, um, and other conditions at Irwin in the past. In July 2016, CRCL conducted an on-site investigation of Irwin, examining concerns related to medical and mental health care, use of force, food service, segregation, recreation, and the grievance system for detained individuals. Pursuant to our investigation, which was informed by subject matter experts, CRCL issued a memorandum to ICE containing 26 recommendations to address deficiencies in the areas of disinfection and sanitation practices, communication and procedures on the handling of infectious disease outbreaks, record keeping and documentation, and language access. ICE concurred with nearly all of CRCL's recommendations and implemented many of them. CRCL also received a number of allegations about unnecessary, unnecessary gynecological procedures performed on detainees at Irwin without informed consent. These allegations are being separately investigated by the Office of Inspector General. Due to pending litigation, DHS is unable to comment further on these allegations, but I can report to you that Irwin is being closed. I want to assure you that our work to address concerns in ICE detention facilities is ongoing. My office, CRCL, is committed to fully investigating all alleged abuses referred to the department to ensure that they are appropriately addressed. CRCL will also continue to play an important role moving forward as DHS looks closely at detention-related issues through our work on developing guidance for evaluating detention facility conditions and concerns. CRCL will also provide proactive advice on how DHS can strengthen and further incorporate principles of civil rights and racial justice into the policies and procedures around immigration enforcement and detention. CRCL engages with ICE and Border Patrol to revise and strengthen enforcement and detention related policies, procedures and training to protect vulnerable populations, including unaccompanied children, members of the LGBTQI plus community, as well as individuals with limited English proficiency and persons with disabilities. We also work directly with ICE to encourage the release of vulnerable individuals from ICE detention. Um, since day one of this administration, CRCL has worked to identify key civil rights principles in several, in several areas, including to inform the department's revision of its civil immigration and removal priorities, its approach to emergency and temporary housing and care for migrant children at the border, and in the department's enforcement and detention posture. On April 27th, DHS issued new guidance to limit ICE and Border Patrol enforcement actions in or near courthouses, recognizing that, quote, executing civil immigration enforcement actions in or near a courthouse may chill individuals' access to courthouses and, as a result, impair the fair administration of justice, end quote. The department is also currently reviewing its policies on civil immigration actions at other sensitive locations, as well as on the address, uh, excuse me, on the address, arrest and detention of vulnerable populations. 
where DHS saw an increase in the number of families and unaccompanied children entering the country between ports of entry, we worked quickly alongside other federal partners and the American Red Cross this year to find appropriate, safe, and sanitary housing for families and unaccompanied children in order to move them more quickly outside of Border Patrol stations. Under the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008, DHS must transfer the care and custody of unaccompanied children to the HHS Office of Refugee Resettlement within 72 hours after determining that the minor child is unaccompanied. Furthermore, to limit the days that families and children spend in, custodian, in, in a custodial environment, ICE ceased to operate one family residential center and in March 21, converted two remaining family residential centers to under 72 hour staging facilities. CRCL is also leading a sexual orientation and gender identity working group, which is examining LGBTQIA plus equity concerns within DHS's workforce, as well as in public facing policies and programs, such as the care of LGBTQIA plus individuals in DHS custody. If I may, I also want to speak directly to the concerns raised with regard to deaths of non-citizens in DHS custody and the increased medical vulnerability of detained non-citizens during the COVID-19 pandemic. DHS has made important updates to detention policies and training that address the concerns raised by petitioners, including establishing clinically appropriate procedures for the physical and mental health care and treatment of detained individuals. C C CRCL is doing other important work that intersects with detention reform by carrying out DHS's commitment and the Biden administration's commitment to racial justice and equity work. We do, we do this with the awareness, as petitioners have stated, that the overwhelming majority of persons impacted by immigration policy are people of color. CRCL leads a department-wide equity task force to help DHS implement the administration's goals on advancing racial equity combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation, and condemning racism and xenophobia. I'm also a member of the White House Gender Policy Council and leading the gender equity efforts for DHS. On June 14th, we announced that USCIS is implementing a new process referred to as bona fide, de bona fide determination, which will give victims of crime in the United States who apply for U visas access to employment uh, authorization sooner, and the majority of people impacted by this improvement are women. CRCL is also assisting DHS in remedying the previous administration's unjust immigration policies, such as the zero tolerance policy that cruelly separated families at the border and the Muslim ban, which was rescinded on day one of this administration. We are committed to continue to dig deeper and root out other systemic equities and inequalities. And that is why, again, thank you for this opportunity and appreciate your attention to these critical issues. Thank you very much. Um, just one minute over the time, so it was, it was fine. Thank you very much. I will give now the floor to my colleagues. First of all, um, uh, Ambassador, sorry, you want, to, you want to take the floor now? I see your hand up. Yeah, is this, um, yes, if this is the appropriate moment. You can either now and uh, or you can either afterwards, you have more, 12 minutes more afterwards, after the, the commissioners make any questions. Let me, uh, let me just uh, make a very brief intervention now. I was, I, I had uh, planned to, um, uh, to introduce, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Kelton Gonzalez, um, but we got our uh, we got our roles mixed up here. So um, let me just thank um, the Department of Homeland Security's Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, uh, Ms. Kelton Gonzalez, uh, for sharing the U.S. statement, and uh, on behalf of the U.S. Mission to the OAS. Uh, we thank the IACHR for the opportunity to meet today with civil society uh, in this public hearing to address these important issues. Uh, the United States strongly supports the work of the IACHR, and we regard the institution as vital to the promotion and protection of human rights in the Western Hemisphere. Public hearings such as the one today play a key role in the inter-American system 
to ensure that OAS member states are mindful of human rights challenges in their respective countries. We recognize that the United States, like all countries, has work to do. The Biden-Harris administration has committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons, as demonstrated through a series of statements and actions, and as outlined by Ms. Colotin Gonzalez. We, um, we again would like to thank the petitioners uh, for sharing their concerns and um, express uh, our sympathy to those who may have suffered as a result of previous um, policies. Uh, I now turn it back to, uh, to you, uh, Madam President. Um, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I will now give the floor, first of all, to, to Second Vice President Flavia Povesan, who is also the Rapporteur for the United States. Thank you so much, Madam President. Uh, first, I'd like to express our deep gratitude and our recognition for this important public hearing, um, which gives the visibility and voice and face to a pattern of serious human rights violations, especially in the in migration detention in the US. Uh, and again, uh, I'd like, as our president just mentioned, I'd like to express solidarity and empathy to the voices of all the victims here represented by the hurting testimony that we heard. And uh, I'd like also uh, to recognize this network um, embracing universities and, and NGOs, which, make, uh, which made this moment possible and also the uh, US um, representatives um, offering us precise information. I just have one question. I heard and I took note about all the, the denounces concerning sexual abuse, sterilization. The commission uh, last uh, October, 2019, adopted a press release on this um, raising concern about uh, historization and the denounce of sexual abuse. And we heard um, the lack of access to health, health care, lack of drinking water, and all the challenges concerning lack, lack of protection of more than 700 uh, persons with COVID-19 and the intersectional approach because uh, we have this impact, especially concerning Afro-descendant, women, LGBTI, and migrants. So we have here all those criteria, I'd say aggravating the level of extraterrestrial discrimination. Uh, and I took note and I'd like to recognize, uh, and for us, for the commission, um, for us, this new administration gives hope, hope, because we can see changes as a reporter for LGBTI rights, uh, I remember at least three or four um, tweets that we recognize concrete advances. So, and we have um, also the reporter, thematic reportership for Afro-descendant, for women's rights. So uh, here we have to recognize concrete efforts and change um, in the US and this message to the region. But to be honest, here we face still a dramatic situation. So my only question to the state um, representation is, is there a plan to close, to reduce those more than 200 detention center devoted to migrants? Uh, because that's the, the point that uh, really calls my attention, this criminal approach to human mobility. I heard, and I, uh, it's, it's really, it's, um, as I mentioned, it gives us hope 
to see all the concrete measures, all the, for all the efforts and the commitment that we know is, very, is deep and is sincere to have human rights as the core of the policy, the state policy in the international affairs. Uh, but um, having said that, is there any plan to dismantle and to reduce and to close uh, this system of migrant de detentions, detentions of migrants? So that's my question. And thank you so much once again, as a counter reporter as well, uh, for us is really uh, important to see all this move and all concrete and precise changes that we recognize um, concerning this new administration. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, thank you, Commissioner Piovesan. I will give the floor to first Vice President Commissioner, Commissioner Mantilla, Mantilla, sorry, also repertoire on migrants. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to start with, um, well, thank you all of you for being here, but I'd like to start with a special message to Wendy for your testimony. Thank you very much. As you said, it was not only for you, but for any other children, women, families that they are not, they shouldn't suffer what you did, what you suffered. And I just wanted to start remember something that is very basic, but I always keep repeating. You know, it's about when we read the human universal human rights declaration, it starts saying that all human beings are born in dignity and human rights. The universal declaration didn't mention anything about nationality, legal status, etc. So I think it's important to, to remember that all the time because. Here we're talking, and I'm talking now as, as a reporter of migrants, uh, because we were talking here about uh, detention immigration, detention center, and we shouldn't talk about detention because migra detention, <laughs> I mean, uh, any state has the right to establish a specific policy for migration, but detention for mig migrants sounds very strong. Other than that, um, um, uh, listening to Wendy and all the information that even the representatives of the state have recognized about the difficult and complicated and very hard situation and condition in these centers. Uh, I'd like to ask first to the state about, they mentioned about the gender uh, training, et cetera, but I'd like to ask specifically about um, the database statistics, what happened with women, specific women, ch child, children, uh, in this center, you know, other than the things that you're going to do, what's going on right now? I'm talking about sexual and reproductive rights. What about sexual abuse? If there were uh, children born after rape in these detention centers, what's going on with that? Uh, because listening with this testimony that Wendy shared with us, that is very, very good. This is, we're talking about torture. And even though any state didn't ratify the Convention Against Torture or even the American Convention, the prohibition of torture is a norm of use cohens, imperative norm. And I, I, I would like to read as well uh, the restatement third of the Foreign Relations Law of the United States of 1987 established, you know, the use cohens norms. And it established the prohibition of torture, you know, Besides, before, sorry, before the, the Inter-American Court, of course, the op opinion of the court, the restatement of the foreign relations law of the state established the provision of torture, you know. And other than that, I like to talk, because you talk about the, the new policy, and I really, really recognize that. I think it's very important that you don't have any more these migrant protection protocols and these new policies. And the, the commission has recognized that last week in one press release about this. And uh, Commissioner Piovesan has recognized as well these things. I like um, to hear from the state about reparation because you're talking about non-repetition, about the future, but what's going on with victims of this situation despite the nationality? You know, that is very good that the things are changed for the future, but what's going on with this person that suffered that? Because when we have a human right violation, 
in the same moment that we have this violation, it is born a right to reparation. So I'd like to, to hear uh, about that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Commissioner Mantilla. Commissioner Ralon. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning to my colleagues. And also, I would like to greet the representatives of civil society organizations, the representatives of the state. And first of all, I would like to say that I was shocked by the testimony that Wendy gave. I want to thank her for her strength, for communicating and letting us know about such a traumatic situation. The most complex thing is that this is a voice that was able to survive in spite of all the complaints because over 20 people have died so far, and they do not have the opportunity to uh, communicate the situation. And that's why Wendy is such an important voice to denounce a situation that is fully against the human dignity of any person. I am rapporteur of persons deprived of their liberty and against uh, torture. And what has been said today is an inhumane and degrading treatment as described. And regarding that situation, I have two questions, a question for the state and a question for civil society organizations. The questions for the organizations is the following. How do you evaluate the implementation of these changes in the policies that the state has listed. What do you think? Do you think it's going to be effective if the effects are going to be immediate or if this is not enough regarding the problem that is there? And with regard to the representation of the state, my question is as follows. Are there is there any policy to provide reparation to the victims, especially the families of those who died and other victims that were able to survive this situation? Do you have any reparation policy? That is my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Rallon. The team of the executive secretary wants to make other questions. Please be brief because we are running out of time. So I would like to give the floor to the Executive Secretary, Tania Renault. You are on mute, Tania. No. We no, cannot sir. hear you. We don't hear you. Write to me on WhatsApp and I will make the question on your behalf. And in the meantime, I would like to give the floor to the special rapporteur. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning. I would like to thank for all the information that we receive. And I'm really concerned, taking into consideration the mandate of my rapporteurship, I'm concerned about the violations of the right to health. I have a very concrete question. After recognizing the efforts of this administration, taking into consideration the pandemic, because we have this urgent issue that is the administration of vaccines, I would like to know the vaccination rollout for uh, migrants in a situation of detention. And also I would, li in, would like to know the vaccination schedule for employees in those detention centers. And also the director of civil rights was asking for recommendations. So I would like to encourage the state and civil society to take into consideration the report of companies and human rights that we did in 2019 that uh, talks about the obligations of the states when uh, services related to human rights are privatized. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Soledad. Tania, 
the executive secretary would like to ask the representation of the state uh, about the following. When you talk about the reform or the amendment of the migration policy, do you have any uh, news regarding the migration reform that you are thinking about? And also I would like, they would like to know about the control mechanisms to check the actions of the companies that are in charge of detaining people. Okay. Um, okay then, um, now since, since we still have time, both, both parties took more time than they had, but um, we still have half an hour. So I will give 10 minutes to civil society and then 10 minutes to the state to answer our questions. Okay, so then we can end on time. And thank you very much again, Wendy, for, for your testimony. I will give the floor, first of all, to civil society for 10 minutes. Thank you. I want to um, thank you all for your for your questions and your observations. I think, uh, as Commissioner, you've pointed out, the number of actions of CRCL is impressive and also is reflective of the inherent violative nature of detention of migrants uh, and the criminalization of migrants and the rights abuses that transpire. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Azadeh Shashahani to speak more specifically as to the situation in Georgia, and then Senator Gandahari will talk a little bit more in response to the other questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it is encouraging that um, the US government has finally decided to go ahead and end the contract for the Irving County Detention Center. I would like to note again, though, that um, you know, if it wasn't because of the documentation work happening, this, um, this would not have happened. And the fact that ICE knew as far back as 2018 about the violations against women's bodies and didn't do anything is very concerning. And I didn't hear anything in the presentation from the US government to address that. Um, you know, where is the accountability? Um, you know, these women have been left with these violations, their spirits, their bodies have suffered and they will have to live with the lifelong damage. Um, and yet we're not hearing anything about accountability for the actors, for the, for the prison corporations and for the US government representatives that um, that made this possible. Um, you know, Irving is, is so open. Uh, we haven't been given a clear timeline as to when the US government plans to shut the place down. You know, again, we are very glad to hear that it will shut down, but people continue to be transferred to Irving and it is cause for huge concern. Um, and also another thing that I didn't hear from the US government a clear answer to is why are people being transferred to the Stuart Detention Center? Um, you know, the U.S. government has started detaining women at Stewart in December. Uh, clearly, they could foreshadow what would come in terms of, you know, the ultimate closure at Irving, and they decided that they needed a quick alternative. Um, except that, as I mentioned during the course of my, re my remarks, this is a deadly place. Eight people have died at Stewart um, in the past four years, two of them by suicide. Um, there is a forced labor program at Stewart. Um, so it boggles the mind as to why the US government thought that this is any type of proper place um, to provide care to women, to providing reproductive care to women. There are now hundreds of women being detained at the Stewart Detention Center. Um, and we have not heard anything about any plans to um, you know, slow down the transfers, um, you know, start releasing people from a store, shutting it down. This is a corporate run detention center being run by Core Civic, a prison corporation that has, has a horrible, horrible track record. Um, and so those are the type of, um, you know, those are the type of changes, actual concrete changes that we need to be hearing about. Um, and then lastly, um, I also didn't hear anything about the surveillance of human rights advocates um, is cause for huge concern. Um, you know, we are trying to do our work in terms of exposing the violations, bringing them to the attention of the public. Um, and um, the, you know, the people from ICE were talking about retaliation, um, taking away access to Stuart from a human rights organization because of their work. Um, I myself received a demand, an order almost from um, a representative from ICE um, the spring of last year after I tweeted about a hunger strike uh, happening at the store detention center, uh, this representative from ICE ordered me to remove this tweet, uh, which of course I did not, uh, because um, this is uh, the United States, free speech is supposed to be a cornerstone um, of this country, and I know my constitutional rights, and I'm not going to stop 
um, exposing the human rights violations. But as you can imagine, um, this is frightening. Um, for a human rights advocate to be receiving a demand like that from the US government is frightening. Um, and for us to know that our activities um, and our human rights work, um, which is totally legitimate and constitutional is being surveilled by the US government is, um, is indeed cause for concern. Um, so I would really like to hear um, representatives from the US government to address the violations. Thank you, Azadeh. Uh, I wanted to, to address this question of, um, you know, the review of the system and inspections and, and improvement of conditions overall. You know, inspections and improving conditions has proven over decades through multiple presidential administrations, Democratic and Republican, to be woefully inadequate. Detention for any amount of time is harmful and it runs contrary to human rights, the mere concept of immigration detention. The only acceptable response uh, to the current review of the detention system is a decision to dismantle it. Immigration detention in the United States is not even a last resort. It's the default. There's no moral justification for it. And yet I will say that most people held in detention in the United States have communities and loved ones in the United States with whom they can live who can support them as they navigate their immigration cases, even the majority of asylum seekers arriving at the border. There is no need for detention and det detention is not housing. It's not an alternative form of housing. For those that require housing, there are trusted community-based organizations throughout the country, ready, willing, and able to provide shelter and services. Detention is not necessary for so-called compliance, uh, the majority of those that are free attend their court dates, and those numbers are almost 100% for those that have attorneys. The alternative to this costly, uh, morally and financially costly detention system is freedom and a system of community-based support and shelter and legal assistance for those that need it. And I, I wanna just add on this question of alternatives to detention, um, they should never increase the scope of who is detained and who is surveilled. Alternatives should never include surveillance, which is inherently punitive and dehumanizing. Um, so again, the only acceptable outcome of a review of the detention system is a decision to begin dismantling its use entirely. Anybody else from civil society you still have four more minutes? Well, I, I can add one more thing and then sorry, Sarah, I'll give it back to you. I, I just wanted to address this question of unaccompanied uh, children at the border. And while we're appreciative of the swift action that the administration took to ensure that children don't spend time in Customs and Border Patrol custody, which is um, very, you know, the, the conditions in, in CBP custody are, are, are are horrific and no child or adult should spend any time in that kind of detention. Um, we note that the administration has been using these large scale facilities that are also completely inappropriate for holding children and have are now the results uh, are, are, are now being investigated um, for the conditions there and what the administration really needs to be doing right now on that front is investing in a long term vision of small scale facilities. Um, to avoid this, these you know problems of of uh, uh, potential abuse and 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 poor conditions for children, and it's not just about how we're treating children when they cross the border. It's about our overall immigration policies and and adopting policies that allow families to migrate together so that they are not separated, so that they are not unaccompanied. Um, so I would really like the administration to be addressing those big picture questions when we're talking about unaccompanied children. Thank you. And I'll just follow up on that. Um, something that we didn't totally address is the rights of the child. Uh, and while the United States has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, as Commissioner Mantia pointed out, uh, Juice Kogan's norms and customary international law are part of US law. And when we're talking about uh, children, we always have to work to protect the best interests of the child. That comes about not only in talking about the detention of children, but in the separation of parents from their children when they are forcibly removed to their, from their homes and taken into detention. 
Um, and as you heard from Wendy, right, the trauma that falls upon the children as well as the parents when that separation happens is significant and cannot be ignored. Um, and so I have, I have nothing more to add. I wanna thank the commissioners for their time. Um, I wanna thank Wendy for being with us today and testifying um, and, and reiterate what you all have already highlighted that the number of of actions that are required by CRCL uh, in response to the current system of immigration detention makes clear that the system of immigration detention itself is inherently violative of international norm. We have been talking about standards and improvements, as I noted in my introductory remarks, since 2008, maybe even earlier. Um, and detention standards were put into place under the Obama administration, and yet we are still hearing these abuses. These cannot all be put at the feet of the Trump administration. This is about a system of detention that allows for people to be isolated in, in rural facilities behind barbed wire fences where access to counsel and access to justice is extremely limited and the resulting lack of accountability and investigation uh, and lack of meaningful oversight over these systems results in the abuses that you've heard about today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I will now give the floor to the representatives of the state. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I will respond for the United States. Thank you so much. Um, it's gonna be hard to answer all of these questions in the period of time that I have. And so I hope that this is an ongoing dialogue. I want to emphasize that. And those that I cannot answer today, I will take back and, and work to answer. Um, our door is open at CRCL. Um, if there are questions or um, that I can't answer, please um, email us at crclcompliance at hq.dhs.gov, crclcompliance at hq.dhs.gov. Uh, GOV. You um, can, sorry, you can always send, you don't have to answer all the questions now, you can always send afterwards all the questions we made, you can send them by, on, by written through the mission. Thank you so much, we, we will work to do that. Um, I also um, uh, want people to know that they can reach us independently or through the commission, um, and I hope that that doesn't disrupt your procedures here today, with great respect to the commission. All of this information is very helpful to us, so please keep providing it to us directly or through the, 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 the Honorable Commission. Thank you so much. Um, there was a last... question about a migration report and that's in the hands, I'm oh, sorry, reform. That's in the hands of the Congress. I'm really sorry about that. We are doing everything we can in our jurisdiction to uh, have more paths towards legalization and legal status for people, for political asylum, for the refugee status, for the reunification of families. We have a new program for minors in Central America. And we have other things that we're doing. We're doing everything we can to have more um, smaller paths that we can actually control. And they are not migration or reform, but they are new alternatives. That there isn't a um, the President Biden put a bill before the Congress on day one, and we're waiting for Congress's response. Um, let's see. Um, when will Irwin close? I'm going to answer that question later, and I'll get back to folks. Why transfer to Stewart? I'm going to answer that question later and get back to to folks. With regard to the alleged surveillance of human rights advocates, that's something that my office is investigating. And any further information that you would like to provide us, please, um, with great respect to the commission, we, we are willing to hear it through the commission and we are also willing to receive it directly at CRCL compliance at hq.dhs.gov. We have an open investigation about um, what you're calling surveillance of human rights advocates. Um, let me see, with regard to whether or not we're gonna close all immigration facilities, that's a very hard question, or whether we would close all um, private facilities. I'm hearing that there's evidence of problems in both private and US government facilities. And so I just wanted to mention that that's part of what it is that I'm hearing and that we're looking at. We take the allegations of human rights abuses serious, seriously. We have multiple levels of oversight that we are reinvigorating um, and we are getting uh, responses to our levels of oversight that CRCL did not have necessarily in the past. Um, 
Um, as I mentioned, on May 20th, Secretary Mayorkas not only directed the closure of Irwin and um, the Carlos Carrero Immigration Detention Center, but also to continue to review concerns with other immigration detention centers regarding four factors. Two of them have to do with issues that we're speaking about today. One is the quality of treatment of detained individuals, and two is the conditions of detention. And then there are other operational factors that we need to take into account. Please, please give us all the information that you have. We know that there are extensive records and reports and testimony and our own research from the past that we're taking into account. But again, the door is open to receiving more information about particular facilities. Um, the national detention standards um, were promulgated in cooperation with ICE stakeholders, um, including civil society and the American Correctional Association. Um, and uh, we also, ICE also implements facility specific policies in, in accordance with the relevant national ICE detention standards. Um, <clears throat> Let me also talk about the number of people in detention. It has decreased 70% since the end of this FY 2019 and by 53% since the same time in FY 20. Currently, if you check the White ICE website, there are 26,197 people in immigration detention. Um, so that is a, a decrease despite an increase in, um, in, in crossings and in, in folks coming into the United States. Um, we also have a need to take care of unaccompanied minors, and we have a need to, um, to, 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 to take care of folks who may come with specific health conditions that we sometimes do so through the, through the detention system. What are we doing to address the spread of COVID in detention facilities? Let me address that head on. And I hear you about prior administrations prior to the Trump administration, but the prior administration had no system in place to test or quarantine for migrants for COVID-19. We are coming from behind. Today, migrants entering ICE facilities are tested and they are quarantined if they test positive. And we, uh, ICE has taken and continue to take important steps to safeguard the health and safety of those in its custody and to detect and mitigate the spread of COVID. These include a working group of medical professionals, disease control specialists, detention experts, and field operators working to identify enhanced steps to minimize the spread of COVID. We recommended that all facilities make efforts to reduce the population at detention facilities to 70% of capacity or less. And as I mentioned, it is down to 70% at the moment. And, and April 10th, um, ICE released the COVID-19 pandemic response, response requirements, a guidance document developed in consultation with the CDC that builds upon previously issued guidance. Throughout, throughout the pandemic, ICE has released several updated versions of the pandemic response requirements, the most recent of which was released on March 16th. Um, ICE has implemented several prevention and mitigation strategies to reduce exposure to COVID, including testing, as I mentioned, but also conducting detailed medical screening of anyone entering the United States and isolating individuals um, who exhibit fever or respiratory symptoms in appropriate medical housing. Any individual who tests positive and requires a higher level of care is, trans is transferred to a hospital. Regarding vaccines, as with all medical procedures, ICE guidance will require the individual's consent in a manner and language that the individual understands and administer the vaccine in accordance with any restrictions based on the individual's medical history. At this time, a limited number of, ICE, of individuals in ICE custody have begun to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Since May 1st, 2021, a total of almost 5,000, 4,986 individuals detained by ICE have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, with regard to the alternatives to detention pilot um, project, it is just as described in depth in my testimony. Um, it does include uh, many of the factors that I just heard about. We're also, again, open to input on that, but it is a, truly an alternative to detention. Um, and uh, it includes, um, we, we are aware of the high level of persons in alternatives to detention and outside of alternatives to detention um, who have been released, um, um, being able to, um, the data shows that they have, um, they have complied with, um, the, with the requirement to, 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 to um, come to their immigration proceedings. So we are aware of that data and we're looking into a pilot project and we're willing to hear more about how to implement the pilot project along the lines of the factors that I just stated. Um, 
I just want to end by saying that, again, the door is open. Um, I'm especially grateful for Ms. Dow for speaking. Um, that sounds like a terrible, terrible trauma. And I'm, unfortunately, there's not a lot more than I can say besides because of ongoing litigation, but Irwin is closing. Thanks to your bravery. Thanks for helping other women who are in the same situation. I hope nothing like that ever happens again in US custody. And I'm working very hard to make sure that that happens. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your testimony as a woman and a survivor myself. We are going to do everything to make sure that that doesn't occur again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, you still have one more minute in case somebody from the state wants to add something else. Can I speak one minute, Ms. Dow? Yes, you can. What I of forgot course. to let you guys know that um, I found out my fallopian tube, Dr. Admin took it out, my fallopian tube. Regardless, I have children that didn't give him the right to take that from me. And I forgot to put it out there. So that's all I was telling you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For that. And I deeply regret that that happened to you. Um, the inspector general will be finished with their report soon and there's ongoing litigation. So I cannot say too much more aside from I deeply regret that happening to you. And there are laws in place to protect that from happening. Um, and we will continue to work to enforce them better. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, again, thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for being here. I think it's very important to give testimonies so that um, not only the state parties, but also everybody that is listening to the hearing can get a sense of what civil society is talking about when we have direct testimonies. Um, the Commission has been very aware of what you have been talking about, um, especially in Georgia. We, we have been doing a follow-up on forced steril sterilization. Unfortunately, it is a practice in the continent, uh, mainly um, against um, Afro-descendants, women, Indigenous women, and poor women and Latin women are throughout the continent. So I'm very sorry about what happened to you and I hope you can have justice and reparation. Um, while, while we were in, in the hearing, we, we received a letter. I just want to mention the letter because it just arrived while we were in the hearing, a letter from the Congress of the United States from the House of Representatives, from a number of representatives. Um, first of all, thanking for this hearing and asking for a site visit from the Commission to the ICDC and other immigration facilities, and also requesting for other actions such as full investigation and accountability and reparations to the victims. Um, of course, that letter we will be um, sending it to both parties so you can have the information. It, I understand it's a public letter, so it's okay. Um, from the House of Representatives, I just want to state out the disposition of the Inter-American Commission to do a working visit to the Iwin County Detention Center and other such immigration facilities, such as the letter appoints, the letter I just mentioned, and also all the, our necessary technical support regarding all the ma matters that have been discussed in this hearing. As always, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has a technical team that can give a support to states and civil society in all the matters that have been discussed here. So I just want to put um, stress out our disposition, both to carry out a site visit, if that is um, an agreement with the state, and also to give any technical support you need on the matters we have discussed today. So I hope we can do a follow-up meeting regarding these matters. And um, hopefully it would be very helpful, I think, especially because of like the transition that the state has already talked about regarding immigration policies. Maybe the okay. technical support that the commission can give would be really important. So I just want to stress that out also. Thank you very much for everybody, for all the information here, for the testimony. And thank you also for, for representatives of the state for all the information you have given us and we will continue monitoring the situation and hopefully um, we can work together on these such important issues. So thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.